Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are at. How's everybody doing? I know you're expecting Rob, right? You're like, wait a minute, this is not Rob. Who's that crazy guy? <laughs> oh, good morning. Can you all hear me okay? I don't have it muted accidentally. I've done that before. Or is it coming through? It looks like it's coming through, but okay, good. Awesome. Thanks, sir. Hello, hello. I see some familiar names. We're going to have a little bit of fun. We always do, right? At least I try to. Maybe you all don't, but I don't know. Hey, Paula. <laughs> Thanks, Suzanne. Welcome up to Power Hour. I'm getting my hot coffee in right now before it gets super hot this afternoon. So it's supposed to be mid to high 90s here. And I'm not a fan of the heat, so. <laughs> awesome, Helen. Hey, good morning. Good morning, Raju. Let's uh, get the disclaimer out of the way. I'm not a registered broker, neither investment advisor. I'm not going to give you any recommendations or advice. Everything we do here is purely for educational purposes. If I do happen to mention a trade, just assume it is a paper trade or practice trade. For regulatory reasons, we do not discuss funded trading here. So here's all the stuff that's coming up in the next little bit. We got Inner Circle, the 14th and the 21st at 7. Uh, Mastermind Group is August 15th and the 22nd at 8. And then E-Mini Think Tank with Brandon the 16th at 8 p.m. Patterns in a Flash with yours truly on the 18th at 8 p.m. Master Market Movers the 23rd at 8 p.m. And then uh, this, wor this, this workshop, uh, Power Hour, every Monday at noon. Trading Coaches Playbook every Friday at uh, noon. I always want to say 9 o'clock there because it's 9 o'clock my time. Becoming a Pattern Whisperer with yours truly again uh, today at 8 p.m. So if you aren't in there, then jump in there. We'll have a little bit of fun tonight. And uh, then tomorrow as well at uh, noon Eastern time. And then the 21st in exactly a week from now at also 8 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be talking about uh, patterns and weekly whispers and how to find them and all the good stuff. So Power Option Plays Tuesday and Saturday. Cover Call Explorer on Thursday. e -mini Think Tank. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and Vegas spread mastery, mastery Monday, Tuesday, and Friday. And of course, you can find us on all the social media platforms. And there's all the information you need to learn to trade. Oops, blank screen. <laughs> there's the uh, becoming a pattern whisperer. That was uh, interesting when somebody dubbed me that. It was humbling and flattering at the same time. It was interesting, but uh, I guess it kind of makes sense. So, so yeah, we'll do one of these tonight. So if you if you have if you're not in there, jump in there, uh, and then tomorrow morning or tomorrow at noon, and uh, and then a week from today also. So let's get to the topic of the hour. Thank you, Francis. There is a link there if you want to get. Uh, Register for that free class tonight or tomorrow. Jump in there. False breakouts and how to potentially identify them. Keyword there is potentially. I think a, uh, a very important skill that we need to learn, not only, I mean, just in general life, but especially I think it's critical in trading, is to differentiate between objective data and subjective analysis. Over the years, I've heard so many people come, well, how do I do this? And how do I do that? It's like, well, <laughs> there is no objective data-driven way to do that. It's a subjective piece, right? Patterns are subjective. Um, data, as far as open, high, low, close, all that information, that's objective, right? It's factual. It's data. It's not, there is no opinion, right? You don't have something where you go, well, I think this, I think that, or I feel this, or I feel that. It's just data. Right, You have one apple, you add another apple, you have two apples. Just data. This is one of the reasons that I've never been a huge fan of the black box systems. In the old days, we used to call them black box. Now they call them algorithmic trading, whatever. They came up with some fancy name for it. It's a black box system. But the issue with the black box systems is that it's purely objective data. There's no subjectivity built into it because you can't build subjectivity into it. You cannot predict human emotion. I, well, let me rephrase that. 
you can't always predict human emotion. Occasionally, and some sometimes you can, right? If we all have patterns of behavior, and if you see the same pattern over and over and over again, then the odds are high. But that's the thing. There's no guarantee, but the odds are high that the next time something similar happens, that's going to be the pattern of behavior, right? When you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you do? I grab my glasses so I can see. <laughs> or if I forgot to take my contacts out, which actually hasn't happened in years, then I got to get some eye drops in my eyes because they're dried out. But, and if you observe yourself, and I know this sounds a little goofy, but if you observe yourself, you'll notice that there are dozens, if not hundreds, possibly even thousands of patterns that we fall into every single day. When you put your shoes on, which one goes first? Mine's always the left. I always start with my left foot. I don't know why, I just do. It's a habit. It's, again, it sounds cheesy, but we do those things. And those behavior patterns show up in trading as well. And what you can't predict in the market is when people are going to panic. And the algorithmic systems don't account for that because they can't, right? They're just data-driven. They take the data that comes in and it says, based on this probability, the odds are this is what's going to happen next. And then it makes a decision, right? All the AI stuff, which I can't stand it. I think it's way overblown. Uh, when I it just did it yesterday, I was texting. And I think I put in not, and it changed to NYT, which isn't even a word. It just blew my mind. It's like, if we can't get AI right just for texting, how are we going to have self-driving cars? <laughs> I'm sorry. I just can't get there. <laughs> if you're changing or a change, but, you know, like I'm going this way, but be, it changes it from but to bit. It, it makes no sense. It doesn't even, it doesn't even make grammatical sense. It's just crazy. So I'm not a big, I'm not a huge believer in AI. Once they have the texting perfected, then I might have a little faith in it. Anyway, <laughs> good, Roman. I know the water would be a good place to be. I'd like to be out there too. But uh, <laughs> exactly, Karen. So one of the things we're going to talk about today, uh, false breakouts are very subjective. We don't know, and they typically, typically will take time to develop. It's not one of those things that happens instantly, and you're not going to necessarily identify it instantly if it is or not. Uh, but one of the reasons I thought this would be a good subject, because it looks like we have a false breakout going on in the markets right now. So we'll see uh, shortly, but there's a few different things that I use to identify potential false breakouts. Price patterns is one. Jump over to, where did it go? There we go. So the SPX, I don't know this is, I think it's it's more dramatic on the NASDAQ, but if we look at a longer term chart on the SPX, you can see there's a very significant support and resistance area there, 45.36, 45.40, right in that range, right? And you see we clearly broke above it for at least a few days. This is a weekly chart, so let's get back to... For a week, well, basically a week. You see, none of these other times, except for this one where we, you know, we barely ticked above it, we closed above it on that that week right there. But for the most part, this line is very solid. It's held, it's held steady. And then three weeks ago, it closed the week quite a bit above there, with not much of a shadow. See, this one back here has a long upper shadow, which is a bearish indication, very bearish indication. And obviously, you can see what happened after that. But here we didn't have that. But then the week after, what happened? We got an engulfing pattern. Actually, a huge engulfing pattern. Which is interesting. Actually, I don't know if I... I can't remember ever looking at this, at least not noticing that on a weekly pattern, but we have that shooting star type of pattern here right before the big crash of 22, right? We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven weeks in a row. We just bled. Except, I mean, we had this intra-week intra move here, but for seven weeks in a row, we tanked. And that was 45.90 down to, whew, actually 46.80 to the bottom, eight weeks, a thousand points. We dropped 20, 25% in two months. Right from that previous, right? And here's another, I mean, I guess you could call this a false breakout too. 
which actually I do consider that as, even though it was several weeks long, two or three months long. But not only did we engulf the previous day, we engulfed two pre or weeks, I should say. We engulfed two previous weeks, which if you know engulfing patterns, then you know that the more candles you engulf, the stronger the pattern. So for two weeks to engulf a, two weeks of patterns, that's a pretty big deal. So is there a way to figure out? See, we got a little bit of a double top going here too. It's not that spectacular. But if we go to the NASDAQ, there's a double top on the NASDAQ, which this one didn't really break out like the SPX did. You can see on the, again, this is a weekly chart. So you can see that that line is fairly solid. There's quite a few, one, two, three, four hits on it before it cracked it here. And then it tried to get above it, failed. Another false break, let me zoom in there. This looks a lot like the SPX, right? The whole week it rallied all the way up. By the end of the week, it was down just barely above that line. And then boom, it tanked just like the rest of the market. Funny enough, just four or five weeks ago, we had a extremely bearish candle followed by a little breakout, right? This, this candle right here, what's that, four weeks ago? And we closed quite a bit above there, quite a bit above where it was here. And the next week, bearish engulfing. Not only engulfed the previous, but engulfed two previous candles. So another very bearish signal there on a weekly chart. And then on a daily, you've got a double top. So we broke out, failed, broke out again, and then failed. Usually that's a pretty good indication right there. Once it tries twice and it gets up there and it breaks back below, that's a pretty solid indication that eh, it's probably not a real breakout. Thanks, Suzanne. <laughs> I was just about to tell Brenda hi and say yes. We'll zoom the other way then, Brenda. That'll help. <laughs> which that takes me to the next point, which is candlestick patterns. And as you saw on the weekly chart, we had so we have some candlestick patterns that are extremely bearish. Same thing on daily charts. Stay, we stay on the NASDAQ here. You've got an evening star here, right? We get a breakout. This one barely breaks above the line, which if you know patterns, and you probably heard me say this before, and I know I see a lot of familiar names, but um, I think, I can't remember if it was Steve Niss or John Murphy. I think it was, I want to say it was John Murphy said, uh, lines should be drawn, support resistance lines, trend lines, they should be drawn with a crayon and not a pencil. So a little tiny breakout like this one here, you know, where it just barely closes above it. I, I don't put a, a, a lot of stock in that, right? It's just one day. It's just barely above it. Not a big deal, right? There's kind of a range here. So I don't draw this line exactly at 14,200 and say, oh, it went to 14,201, therefore it's a breakout. You got to give it some room. There's a range there, right? The next day, obviously, we followed through. It gapped down a little bit, but then the bulls came back and ran it higher and closed it quite a bit higher. So now at least it looks like a breakout. Is it though? We don't know. And they don't happen usually within days. They take, usually they'll take several days, if not several weeks to play out to see if it's actually a breakout. And that's one of the reasons I love uh, the old role reversal, right? If we get a good solid breakout to the upside, the way to find out if it's legitimate or not is if it pulls back and it uses the old support as, or the old resistance as support. I think, did it do that here on the NASDAQ? Yeah, so you could even argue this is not a, whoops, let me go backwards here. Here you've got a peak, right? We hit a high, we hit a high, fell from there, came back up, challenged it, challenged it. We hit it two or three or four days in a row, then boom, broke out. That's a pretty solid breakout, a big solid candle that went all the way through it, and then it continued to go. Now, even all the way up into here, I would be a little bit suspect, but then it pulled back It found that old resistance, used it as support, and launched off there again. So this right here tells me that, okay, we have a solid confirmed breakout when it uses the old resistance as support and launches from there. I think it did it again here. Yeah, it did. So we came back to that 14.2, recognized it again, and then rallied from there. And then, of course, you know, back here in what, early 22, we cracked right through it.
Whoa. There we go. So on top of the price patterns, which you've seen, you know, double tops, those types of things, we can look for candlesticks, right? Evening star, uh, here we tried again, and then it broke back below two days later. So this on a short-term basis, definitely a false breakout because we cracked right back below it in a big way. Not just a little bit, but a lot. That's a big candle. That's a clue that says, okay, the bulls were in control here for a day or two. And then the bears came in and just destroyed them. And they kept it below that level for a while. Then they gapped it up one morning. The bulls got all excited. I can't remember what caused that gap. There's some kind of news though. Or was that Apple earnings? I think that was Apple earnings. Uh, or Amazon. I think that was Amazon earnings because Apple didn't move much at all. It was down a little bit. Amazon was up a whole bunch. And Amazon's a heavy weighting in the NASDAQ. But we basically have a bearish engulfing pattern. We engulfed two previous days. And we come up a couple of days later, we have another quasi evening star. It's not beautiful. And then a gap back below that level. So when you got a double top like this and you got several candlestick patterns that indicate weakness, evening star, bearish engulfing pattern, quasi evening star, and then a big gap below that level again, that's a pretty solid clue that this breakout above that 14.2 level is probably not going to hold. The SPX is somewhat similar. Whoopsie. All right, we get a break above that level, evening star. It stayed above the level, though. A little different than the NASDAQ. Rallied just a tiny bit, a few little small, tiny days, and then a big gap up. Again, I think that's the, yeah, that's still not the Apple and Amazon, or mostly Amazon earnings, but gaps up and then it sells off the whole day. Engulfs three days. Another quasi evening star and then a gap down. And that day they cracked back below that level and it stayed below there ever since. We're finding a little bit of support here from this open window back in, what was that, July? So I wouldn't be surprised to see it rally a little bit from here or at least kind of stall out. But if it doesn't, it cracks there, then the next level we're headed to is down here about, I don't know, what's that, 4350, 4330, somewhere in there. 4302 is the major level. So again, and you've got, even though this isn't a beautiful double top, it's not as nice as the NASDAQ, but it's there. We look at the Dow. Again, this doesn't really break out as much as the other markets did, but bearish engulfing pattern. Pretty solid looking evening star there, all at the same level, all at a previous resistance, and it stayed below there. They tried Friday. That is, is that? Oh, no, these haven't updated. Thursday, they tried to get it above that level. The bulls ran it back up there intraday, but then by the time we had to close, the bears had it all the way back down to the bottom. I know some of you are saying, well, what about the Russell? <laughs> I'm getting there. So volume is another one that can be a big clue. And the challenge is we don't have good solid volume on these. The data on the volume has been off for a while. I know that the, the um, Omega charts, they've changed data providers. And so the volume is a little eh, iffy. Um, I wonder if... I don't know if I have it on there. Thought I did. I'm trying to see if I have it on my toss charts. Let me see if I can get it on here real quick. I don't want to run. I want studies. Quick study. Oh, that's weird. Came up on the other screen. <laughs> All right, I'm not going to fight that. Let's just look, we'll just look at the stock, see if we can find one that, um, I don't know, if, see if we can find an example. Uh, no, that's not a good example. If anybody wants to name a stock, we'll take a peek and see if we can find anything. Well, there's Google. Let's see what the if those lines are solid. Uh, yeah, this is a good example right now. So we have obviously a pretty solid support level here, right? This is a weekly chart. Whoops. So you can see, I mean, again, this is a weekly chart, and you've got three different hits on it, very solid hits here at that 130 level. And then we've got 136 is pretty solid as well, it looks like. Not super solid, but it's there. Uh, but we broke above that level, that 130 level, on earnings, yeah. Well, there's the tricky part, too, is that sometimes you have these things that are news-driven, and are they really... 
it's justifiable for them to stay up at that level. So big gap on earnings news, lots of volume driving it, which could mean it's a good breakout, but is it just news related? That's again, where you get the subjective part where you're like, eh, is it legit or not? And usually a good solid breakout is a company with significant volume. If you don't have significant volume, whether it's a breakup or a breakdown, then you should treat it with caution. It's definitely suspect that there's not volume, especially on a break to the upside. A downside break, because a stock can fall by its own weight, right? It's kind of like if you start at the bottom of a hill and you have this huge boulder and you're pushing it up manually up the hill. That takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, right? But if you just step out of the way of this big boulder, what happens? It just rolls downhill by its own weight. You don't have to do anything. Gravity takes it with it. And stocks aren't any different, right? If no buyers come in, if nobody's actually pushing it up the hill, then the market makers just have to start lowering their price until somebody comes in to try to stop the boulder from falling, right? And if there's nobody there to stop it, it rolls down to the bottom of the hill. Um, so on a bullish breakout, something to the upside, heavy volume is more critical. But you can see with Google here, we gapped up based on the news. And then we put a line in there so it's a little easier to see. So you can see pretty significant volume. And you've got the next three or four days rally up. You get kind of an evening star, but look at the volume the next three days. It did not sustain itself. In other words, people got all excited on the earnings. And then a lot less people showed up to the party the next day. And the next day, there's even less people showing up to the party. It's only an average number of people showing up to the party on the, the, the two days after earnings, right? Or the third day, whatever it is. And the next day, there was actually more people going out the back door than there were coming in the front door. I mean, look at that, that huge drop in volume. We went from almost double the average to 20, 30, 40% below the average. That, again, is a clue that says, yeah, we broke out on earnings, good news, but the bulls really aren't maintaining their excitement. They're not calling their friends and inviting them to the party anymore. They're not calling anybody. They're just at the party and having a good time while it lasts. Right? So it sells off a little bit. Not a huge sell-off volume either. The volume has pretty much died in the last couple of weeks. So the question becomes, which way will it break? Will the party die off completely and everybody just leaves, goes out the back door and it falls? Or will somebody get up on stage and rile up the party and say, hey, call your friends again, bring them in. And then boom, the bulls come back. I know a little cheesy analogies, but... <laughs> They work in his twisted mind. <laughs> Maybe not enough coffee. So volume is one thing that can give you a clue. When you learn to analyze the volume and recognize, and that's why it's it's a little weird to think of it like that, but that's kind of, I relate things to real life in a lot of ways. And again, it seems a little goofy, but it works. So. Yeah, and CPI and PPI, it seems like the it seems like the market's losing interest in that though. And I don't know if you've all noticed it, but uh economic data will be the market will focus on it like a laser beam for a time, especially if it's wonky, if it's out of ordinary. Like CPI and PPI have been watched for the last year, year and a half. Once inflation started to rage and it really went crazy, everybody was just laser beam on those those little those pieces of data. And then now that it's been kind of cooling off a little bit for the last 12, 14 months, I mean, people are still watching it, obviously, and we're still watching it, but it doesn't seem to have the impact that it was in the beginning. But I think that's because the volatility has died down a little bit. You know, it ticked up, what, two-tenths of a percent this last announcement last week? We went from 3 to 3.2, which isn't massive, but it's definitely concerning from an inflation perspective. Because if you look at oil, oil is, where'd it go? Crude oil, 82 but right now. It's just barely over 82 right now. It's down about a buck today, right now. But it was at 67, 70 bucks just two or three months ago. So that's a 20, 25% increase. So your fuel expenses are gonna go up here shortly because there's always a lag, right? Oil goes up and then eventually the uh, end product that has to get produced will go up as well. So inflation, I think, is going to kick back in. Uh, the other thing that may be a, a huge driver for inflation is, and this is one I've, 
I mean, speaking of keeping close tabs on things, commercial real estate market, I never used to pay attention to. And now, you know, I've got a few people that I look at and watch and see what they're talking about. There's people that keep really close tabs on it and they put data out as far as this is what it is. The co commercial real estate market is hurting bad. And I think it's going to get worse, which will spill over into the banks because there's a lot of multifamily housing units, right? Apartment buildings that they built in the last, you know, two months, two years or so. And most of those either have a bridge loan or a construction loan, which eventually rolls into a, um, not necessarily a permanent because most commercial real estate deals are done with, um, I want to say arm. I don't know if it's technically an arm in the commercial space, but whatever it is, it's it's basically a variable. And most of them have a five or a 10 year term from what I understand. And that's a bloom payment. You either pay it off or you refinance it. Well, a lot of people with commercial property refinanced in you know, 2020, 2021, when rates were dirt cheap. And now after you know, two, three, four years later, five years later, when that loan comes due, when that balloon payment's due, they have to refi from a two or three or 4% rate up to a seven, eight, 9% rate. Obviously that increases their costs of maintaining the building, right? Significantly. If you have an apartment complex, what are you going to do? If you just built one in the last year or two and you had a bridge loan or construction loan, um, yeah, that's going to roll into a high one. And it was only when, one way to make up for that extra interest you're paying. You're either taking smaller margins or you have to raise your rents. So it's... Uh, from a macro perspective, it's a pretty ugly picture as far as how things could play out. And uh, I've got friends in the mortgage industry, and one of them said they're doing a lot of restructuring as far as how they're doing things. Banks are getting tight. The credit's getting tight. It's getting harder for them to get loans. So, and, and I mean, we've seen this story play out before, right? When credit gets tight, banks start to pull back. Then commercial people can't get loans. Small businesses can't get loans. There's lots of stories out there right now all over the place small businesses that cannot get lines of credit from these little regional banks. They're pulling back to protect themselves, which ultimately hurts the small guy, right? Um, so it is, uh, there's lots of little storms brewing offshore. And if one or two of them come together and converge, then it could turn it into a big, massive storm. I know a lot of people don't like to hear that. Okay. <laughs> I've been a bear for like two years now. <laughs> okay. And this run we've had, I still don't, I, I still don't have a lot of faith in it. Um, because of the underlying data and the stuff that's going on. And the market is famous for, uh, as Greenspan put it, irrational exuberance. The market, can, there's the old saying for those of us that are bears, that if you've ever been a bear, <laughs> you'll probably heard it. Right? The market can stay irrational longer than you can stay liquid. Uh, and that happened in you know the late 90s. I know people that were trading before me. I started in 2000, but I know people that were trading then. And they started shorting stuff. And they're like, this is crazy. There's no way these valuations keep up. And they'd short something at 200 bucks and it'd run to 300. And they're upside down huge. Or they'd get stopped out and take a loss. But then eventually the market corrected. And did you know what it should have done. So. But that's the thing. You never know when or how it's going to come or if it's going to come. I mean, eventually it will. So um, Roman. More sell-off or a correction before the fall? Ugh. I think ultimately, ultimately, I think we're going to have a pretty significant crash. Like I said, I mean, we're talking about the storm brewing. There's lots of um, lots of little storms kind of hanging out offshore. And like I say, if one or two of them connect up and there's a convergence, then it sucks the rest of them in. And, and all of a sudden, you know, we're off to shore and it's doing a lot of damage. That's my personal view. Uh, I think this market is on a razor's edge just because of all the underlying macro data. It looks, I mean, when you look at the chart here, you're going, hey, this looks great. Wonderful. Look at it. We're almost back to the highs. But then again, go do some analysis and look back. Okay, you had 17, 18, 19. We actually were forming a broadening pattern there and it broke out. And funny enough, it still kind of was. 
But then we had COVID hit, right? We were at all-time highs. COVID hit, boom, hammered. And then it rallied back. Why? Well, not really a conspiracy theorist, but I think that uh, the Fed, considering that we can't see their books, we don't know what they do. I think they took and printed a boatload of money and just started piling it into the market because they know that these things are that happen when people panic. They're well aware. They're not stupid. I think they poured a ton of money into the market. I'm 99% certain that they have the ability to go in and buy equities, just like a hedge fund, but nobody knows about it, right? It's in the, it's in the dark. So this catapulted the momentum to the upside. And then they start throwing cash out to the economy and sending everybody home and people are sitting at home, you know, the 20 and 30 somethings. They're like, what am I going to do now? Well, let's trade the market. Sweet. Uncle Sam just sent me a few thousand bucks. Let's go trade. And then they just start buying, buying, buying. And it just starts pushing them higher. And then they think they're geniuses. And like, hey, I'm a master trader. <laughs> and then this happened. And they all went, uh-oh, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> At least the ones that are realistic, right? But uh, so, yeah, it's uh, it, it's definitely a wild card. But I think, again, in my opinion, I don't see how we can justify staying up here. Especially when you, if you're looking at the, the superficial data, and a lot of people are pointing to unemployment, unemployment's low. Well, yeah, because some people are getting second and third jobs just to, to keep up. People that were going to retire in the, you know, the last year because the market got trashed, right? So they watched their retirement account go from a half a million down to 350 or 400,000 in 22. I'm like, oh, I better not retire for a couple more years. Better wait for it to come back. Uh, then inflation kicks in and their expenses go up and they're going, well, and you start running the numbers on retirement. Are you going to be able to survive in retirement? Well, I don't know if I can now. So there's, I'm sure there's a lot of people because you've got the second half of the baby boomers that are just starting to hit retirement age, right? My mom's a first year baby boomer, 1946, right? So she's 76, yeah, she's 76. But so the, the first half is essentially retired, but the second half of the baby boom generation is hitting retirement age. And the inflation picture and the housing cost picture. And that's another thing, speaking of the housing market. And there's a lot of people out touting this idea that, well, the housing, housing market's not going to crash because, uh, well, supply, the, the supply. There's, there's no supply. Well, of course there's not. Why not? If you have a 2 or 3% mortgage, are you going to sell your house unless you absolutely need to? Are you going to unload it and, and go take a 6 or 7 or 8% mortgage on somewhere else? Probably not. There's no incentive to move right now. There's no reason to take an optional move when you have a super cheap rate. And so there are tons and tons of people just not listing their house because it makes no financial sense. So it makes perfect sense that supply is tight. What is, um, is, is it DHR? No, that's not it. Who's the home builder? Um, DR Horton. Is it DRH? Going. What is DR Horton's? <laughs> I can't remember their symbol. I just looked at it last week too. DR Horton. How come I'm trying? <laughs> How can we get find DR Horton? <laughs> what's the um p a what's pull to helms p h r d h r that's what i thought didn't i type that in that's danaher did danaher buy him d h i thank you trip that's right <laughs> i was close i was only one letter off <laughs> i was in the same boat karen so we're good <laughs> i mean you look at this thing get rid of those there's no i mean this is the there's, a, there's an all-time high. This is a home builder. They're building new homes. H how is it? I mean, this thing was 60 bucks. It's literally doubled in the last year. Why? And I started thinking about this a few weeks ago when I realized these guys are at all-time highs. And I hear all these people talking about the tight supply, which makes sense because nobody wants to sell their existing home. So people that are buying homes, what are they buying? They're buying new homes. And also what I've seen is that the 
people that are on the edge of retirement. I just met those gentlemen we, a few weeks ago. We were having a conversation. I don't remember how I met him, but um, he lived in an old house. He said, I've got an old house that was built in the 60s. There's problems with it. I had to replace the water heater. And I don't know how to do it myself. I had to pay somebody $2,000 to replace my water heater. It was crazy expensive. And he goes, I'm going to retire in a year or two. And I don't want to have house problems. I don't want to have to be fixing the house. He's buying a brand new home. He's going to rent that other one out, not to mention the crime because he's in kind of a shady area. So he's leaving for the crime and for the fact that when he retires, he doesn't want to have problems how, with, with his house. So he's buying a brand new home. He's going to rent that one out. And all of a sudden I'm going, there you go. Baby boom generation doesn't want to have housing problems. So they're buying brand new houses and they're renting out their old home because they have a dirt cheap interest rate. Or they'll sell it if they have enough equity, they'll sell it and you know take the cash, whatever they're doing. But um, that started to make sense when I started to see that. I'm going, that's why the new builds are tearing it up. They're selling like hotcakes because that's where the bulk of the supply is on the market right now for houses, is new housing. So sometimes you're just putting the pieces of the puzzle together and going, oh, you take these little pieces and go, there you go. There's why this thing doubled in the last 12 months. Is it going to keep up? That remains to be seen. I don't expect it, but we'll see. Um, what else? I know there's some other questions or comments here. I answer your question, Roman. That's a super long answer to a well. Yeah, that's the question is, are we going to crash or are we just going to, are we going to fall lower slowly? And we don't know. And, uh, you know, for those of you that some people get all cranky that, oh, you're such a De Debbie Downer. It's like, you know what? I'm preparing for the worst. I'm hoping for the best. I hope that things stay steady, but I hope that they don't crash. But if they do, then I want to be in a position to not only survive it, but thrive in it. So that's where my mindset's at. Even though I know I talk bearish a lot and I say, you know, this and this, and this, and I put out negative news that looks bad, you know, it's only negative if you don't take advantage of it, if you don't learn to uh, profit from it. So, and there's some people out there that are like, oh, that's not right to profit from other people's misery. It's like, I'm not profiting from their misery. The market's going to go down whether they're miserable or not. I don't have any control over the market. The market's a big place. I don't have any control over it. And why should I go down with the ship, right? Why should I be miserable right alongside with them? That's not, it that doesn't make any sense to me. There's not an ethical or moral reason to be miserable with everybody else. Why not improve my life financially? And then, you know what? Maybe if you're in the right position, if you really tear it up, Maybe those people that are in need, you can uh, maybe spot them a little bit, right? Is Google consolidating? Google or Google, they, they're both, they look the same. So yeah, basically. And there is actually, there's a little bit of a flag or a pennant type of pattern going on, right? Those that have patterns of flash probably saw it right away. Those of you that don't need to get it. Shameless plug. But it needs to break out either today or tomorrow. So if it does, if it breaks out today to the upside, then there may be another one more leg to the upside. But the overall market is definitely a little sketchy. So um, maybe an election run for the Dems. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know. I mean, I, it's not that uncommon for the market to be to be bullish in presidential election years. Uh, that's statistically, I think that's, it does something like two thirds of the time, 75% of the time, uh, the market's in a bull market before election years. But, uh, again, that's, that's objective data that statistically says that it's likely to happen. That doesn't mean it's guaranteed to happen. So, and I would venture to say that this election is a little bit, uh, <laughs> a little bit goofier than most. So it will certainly be interesting. And, uh, I think chaotic is what we're going to have. So it's rather sad in my opinion, but you know, in the old days, in the old days, you used to be able to have a, a, a debate with somebody and, and be respectful and remain friends afterwards. Now it's just, it's all out war. It seems like it's like, you know what? You have your opinion. I have my opinion. You know what? I respect your opinion, whatever. I mean, you're entitled to your wrong opinion. If your opinion was like my opinion, you'd be right, but you're not. So it's okay. You can be wrong. Uh, oh, okay, okay. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly, Roman. When your shoe shine guy starts giving you stock advice, you know that's the end. Or the bagger at, at Safeway. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, man, go buy this stock. Did you buy AMC? <laughs> uh, no, I'm not crazy. Yeah, that's, um, I forget, you just jogged a memory, Karen. The one thing that uh, elections will do, you have a cyclical in news media, right? If you have media companies that are publicly traded, that's when their ad revenue goes up, right? So you have these cycles in that industry. So it might be specific to those industries. But then again, that is becoming, that, that, whole, that whole industry, as far as news goes, is getting extremely fragmented. Right? You've got YouTube and you've got all these streaming services. You don't have just mainstream media anymore. My goodness. <laughs> uh, <laughs> whoops, that slipped out. Uh, right. So the advertise, advertising dollars are getting spread out to different places now, where they used to be pretty concentrated into kind of one little funnel. But now they're kind of all over the place. I mean, there's still the bulk. You know, YouTube, I think, is for online streaming is probably one of the biggest. But uh, something to keep in mind. I'm I'm not necessarily going to make a trading decision, but do I keep it back here? And go, okay, that's Fox News or CBS. I don't know. Who, I don't know any other publicly traded. The only reason I'm thinking of Fox is because I traded it about three or four months ago. It was tanking and it worked out beautifully. Um, when they got rid of Tucker, it tanked. Um, but whatever other ones are publicly traded, just keep it in the back of your head. That's all. Are you talking about my stories trip or my analogies? <laughs> All I see is they get goofy with every iteration. It must be, you must be talking about my goofy analogies. Oh, the elections. Yeah, that's very true too. My analogies do too. Um, oh, really, Roman? That sounds interesting. He says a movie called Dumb Money coming out, uh, coming out soon about the GameStop short. Yeah, that'd be interesting. I'd like to see that actually. Whoops. So there's two more things here. Intermarket analysis, I'll just hit them real quick and increase volatility. Uh, the intermarket thing, I was holding off on that with the Russell. This is one that, and I'll go back and show, and I know some of you have seen this before because I've shown it several times, but so there's the COVID crash, right? And the bounce back, we rally, we rally, boom, and it, things just catapult north. And actually, I'm going to get rid of all those. And then it stalls out. And if we put the SPX over top of it, we overlay it. So that purple line, the black line is a Russell. And the purple line is the herb magenta for those, those of you OCD folks. That's magenta. Uh, <laughs> you can see the Russell stalled out, peaked out, hit an all time high in March of 21. And the SPX just continued to rally. Just went, woo, keep on going, keep on going. Yeah, the Russell stalled. If you're not familiar with the Russell, the Russell is the, the Russell 2000, right? This is a small cap index. So it's the little companies. And you've probably heard when we're in a recession, well, it's small businesses that bring us out of a recession, which is true. But the inverse of that is true as well, that they also lead us into a recession because they're the, the little rowboat out in the ocean that's just trying to catch you know, one or two fish versus the massive, massive tuna boat that is huge and is trying to take in a whole load. But one boat is significantly smaller than the other. And if a storm starts to brew and the, the, the water gets choppy, that little boat's running for shore as quickly as possible. The big boat's like, hey, we're good. We can stay out here and catch some more fish. But the little guy goes running for the shores because he doesn't want to capsize because he doesn't have a lot of room for air. Same thing in business. You got the Microsofts, the Apples, the Googles, the Fangs of the world, right? They have massive billions and billions of dollars in cash sitting there. It's like a huge aircraft carrier that, you know, they can weather the storm. They don't have to worry too much about it. They don't have to shift gears quickly because they have a lot of room to burn through cash before they really have to get concerned. 
So the Russell, to me, and this is where the intermarket analysis comes in, when you look at different markets, that was a clue. Because you'll notice it just went sideways. In this period, the Russell just went sideways for a whole year, basically. It was the end of, it was like January is when the original, well, not the first peak, but that period is basically about a year long. It's January to January, essentially. So the entire year of 21, well, the SPX, the Dow, and the NASDAQ were still raging north. The Russell's going sideways which to me from a macro perspective was a huge clue that said, mm, yeah, this economy is not as spectacular as the major markets are indicating. And if you're not familiar with the major markets, what you'll notice, especially with the NASDAQ, I think they all are too, but the Dow is as well. They're very heavily, heavily weighted to certain stocks. I think it's the NASDAQ. You've got Apple, Google, Facebook, and... What are, there's four or five stocks that make up like 30% of the market cap of the index. Which means if those stocks, if those handful of stocks are still going north, then the index will continue to march north. You can have 80% of the NASDAQ going south, heading, heading down, and the, the top 20% of the biggest companies still going north, and the index is still going to go north. Right? So it can be deceiving when you're looking at the major indexes. And that's one reason it's important to do the intermarket analysis to make sure you understand that those big companies make up a big portion of it and they drive the indexes. So where they're at right now can be very deceiving. But you can see just that period. For a whole year, the whole year of 21, Russell just went sideways. It bounced between, what was it, 2100 and 2300? while the rest of the markets kept going north. This was one reason that is when I turned bearish. That's when I started looking at this market and going, you know what, something's not right. 22 is a good year. And what you'll see is getting back to the false breakouts that we're talking about right there. And I remember this very specifically, the Russell right here broke out to the north because I kept seeing them, the rest of the markets and watching them going, they're, no, they're going north, they're going north. SPX broke out, right? had a previous high right there. SPX breaks out, the Russell breaks out, and quite frankly, sometimes it's just gut feel, right? Once, and a lot of it depends on experience. Some of it, you'll just learn to see. You'll just learn to recognize certain little things, like a lot of things we've talked about, right? You got price patterns, candlestick patterns, volume. Then you do some intermarket analysis, and you go, you know what? This just looks weird. It's going sideways and it just, it, something just didn't feel right. And so even though I'm looking at it saying we got a bullish breakout, I don't believe it at this point. And after a week or two, it turned back down and dropped back in that range and sold off and then dropped back to the lows and then it bounced again. And then the SPX started south. And that's when, so sometimes you can tell with looking at different markets. And you'll notice too, and that's the other thing too, it not, only, not only back then in 21, but currently look at what's going on. You can see the SPX, right? It's rallied way up here. And a lot of times these indexes run in tandem. And the other interesting part back here, if you go back to 20, right? The Russell actually ran faster than the SPX did. And then it stalled out. And the SPX kind of stayed in this nice steady path which made sense that it kept going. And this one stalled out. Like this one sprint, the Russell sprinted up the hill as fast as it could. Like, whoo, I need to catch my breath. And so it did. It spent a whole year catching his breath. And then realized it couldn't keep running. But for the most part, these trade in tandem. And you can see they stay pretty close together. But in the last six, eight months, the SPX broken out, made new highs almost not, not all-time highs, but 52-week highs, and the Russell has not. The Russell is still struggling. This is where a lot of the regional banks reside. This drop right here, back in March, that's the, uh, in fact, let's just, that right there, that's the regional banks dying. Because a lot of them, right, they're small, and they, they live in the Russell. I think that's part of the reason this one is still struggling, because a lot of the banks are not in good shape. And I think that that could be, uh, if that shoe drops, if another decent size, medium size, or even a large bank collapses, 
I think you could have a very swift, uh, very, very swift storm taking things down. So, but similar picture on the Russell, going back to what we started with was, you know, you got kind of an evening start, tried to break out of this 2000 level. It only did for one day. And then we get a hangman the next day, Harami had a hangman at the same time. And it's just dropped ever since. Last two weeks, it's just been dropping almost every day. We got this little open window it just filled. So I wouldn't be surprised if we find some support here. It is a little bit today. It's actually sitting right at the 50 day. It bounced on it and bounced on that previous high. There's the 50. So I can see it holding this level today and maybe dancing on it for a few days. It We very well could bounce. But if it cracks that level, the next the next major spot's down there by 1812. 200 day may slow it down a little bit, but we'll see. And the other thing is volatility, and I'll um, I'll hit that real quick. It's it's a little harder to spot sometimes, but this is one thought an example. If you ever see a broadening pattern, okay, when, when you just look at this and and just like common sense analysis, you say, okay. We swung up here, we pulled back, we came up, made a new high, which means the bulls were even more excited. And then the bears came in and pushed it down and got even lower than the previous one. So that means the bears are super excited. And then the bulls say, no, no, no. And they come in and get even more excited. And then the bears get super excited. So it's a, it's the tug of war gets more intense back and forth, right? So when you see patterns like this, especially when they're at a top, they're not necessarily easy to trade. But you can see there's an all-time high on, this is ADI. They're hard to trade because you've already had this big drop, right? This was at 200. It dropped 20 points, basically 10% in about two or three weeks. It's most likely going to have some kind of retracement. It's not likely to continue falling. The odds aren't there. It could, but it doesn't happen like that very often. So if it bounced and held this line for a few days or a week or two, and then it cracked, now I'm a little more apt to trade it. But the broadening pattern is a little bit hard to trade, at least like this one where it is. But that is an indication of the end of a move. If you have a trend that's in place and you get an increase in volatility, that's usually an indication the trend is coming to an end. The question becomes how long before it actually ends. Sometimes it can be quick. Other times it takes forever, right? So, so when you see an increase in volatility, again, that's typically a change of direction. Very true, Karen. But I don't think uh, I don't think they can really control the market. That's the that's the part that I would question is do they have the ability to control the market's a big place? And there's what trillion and a half dollars every single day changes hands. Um, and if a bank, especially if a big bank fails, not much they can do about it. I mean, at some point they got to, they can't print money. The Fed can't come in and really lower rates because, right, inflation will kick back in again. And then you have horrible inflation again, possible hyperinflation. Um, Fed's in a tough spot. I don't envy Jay Powell, that's for sure. He's uh, He's got a tough job on his hands. So the whole Fed does, which, I mean, ultimately, if you ever, <laughs> if you ever read the, the creature from Jekyll Island, Ultimately, every single central bank at some point eventually fails. They can't, they can't manage the economy, especially when it gets too large. So uh, we'll see. They keep experimenting throughout history. It's been tried. And it's, it's never really been successful. So the question becomes, you know, will our country collapse and die in my lifetime? Or is it going to happen, you know, 100, 200, 300 years down the road? I don't know. <laughs> you never know. Maybe they'll get it right this time, but the funny thing is, is they never have, ever, <laughs> throughout history. There's never one central bank that's ever lasted, I can't remember what the number is, is 200 years, 250 years or something like that, that they've ever made it, and then things collapse, because they don't manage things. They, they don't know how to do it right. They're always late, they're behind the ball, and, and, and that's where this Fed got it wrong, is they should have started to hike interest rates earlier. They waited too long. It's transitory. No, it's not. They should, have, they should have done it faster in the beginning. But what it should have could is there a dime a dozen. It's easy to look back and see what's in, in, in the rearview mirror. So Amazon, real quick analysis. There's a longer-term picture of it. I don't think, whoops. There's monthly. We don't need that much. But definitely have some, uh, 
pretty solid resistance there about 144. I mean, like really solid. Like after the COVID, it rallied, it broke above 144, tapped it, tapped it, tapped it, broke below it for who knows, a day or two. These are, these are weekly bars, right? So, and then the next week it was back above it, came down, broke below it, but held it on a closing basis, rallied. And then when it crashed last year, it crashed right through it. And then when it bounced from there, where did it find it? It found it there. So that's what I would expect to have happen here. We've already kind of sort of hit it three weeks ago. 143.63, close enough. We hit it and pulled back. And then we've got this little bit, not any huge solid signs yet of a reversal, but they're not always like this. I mean, here you have a hangman, right? At previous resistance, huge tall hangman on a weekly. And then the next day or the next week, broke above it for maybe a day or two, I'm guessing, and then dropped back off and sold off. And that's when the crash, well, I don't know if there's a crash, but it's definitely a big drop. 144 to 80. Yeah, that's almost in half. So at this point, I, other than this open window, I mean, if it dropped back below this 136, I would expect it to come back down into this range, somewhere in there. If everything was to just tank, yeah, it's probably coming back to 121. So I don't see anything. There's, there's nothing really compelling right here that tells me that, you know, it's time to get into Amazon in any way, shape, or form. I wouldn't be bullish because 144 is a massive resistance. If it breaks out of 144, that's a different ballgame if we go bullish. If it breaks below 136, then I would be bearish down to about 130 with the possibility of it coming down if, if it doesn't hold that, that open window, if it doesn't hold that support level, which could be anywhere from there to even in here. So somewhere in that range, it may hold that level. If it holds that level and starts to dance around, I'd take my profit if I got in below this line. If not, it might crash right down to 121. If it did that quickly, I'd be banking profit. But Oops. HD and then NVIDIA, and then we got to call it a day. HD. Did they just come out with earnings? I see the little earnings bubble down there. 815, 16. That's coming out in. Where's my H? There it is. I got to sing the alphabet song in my head. 815 before the market. That is tomorrow. Yeah, a little double up going on. That's irritating. This is why I love patterns, right? But And there's a nice ascending triangle. Dances on it, breaks out for a couple of days, pulls back, roll reversal, exactly what we're looking for. Unfortunately, I'm cranky. I missed this move. I stopped watching it because it broke back down here. And I should have <laughs> I should have kept my eye on it, but... You're going to have that happen. No matter how long you've been trading, you're going to miss them all the time. And it's frustrating and aggravating, but you just have to learn to accept it. Because, yeah, it was, uh, it was a nice big move, went right to the target. It played out just like the pattern said it would. So, But it's nice when you do catch them. And I do catch these when they happen. So uh, this one I happen to miss. But, uh, yeah, it's definitely showing some weakness. I wouldn't really call it a double top, but we're at that, again, previous high right before the bolt before the COVID. So that's the crazy thing too, is, is Home Depot really as profitable as they were back here in 21 when the pandemic took off when the COVID crashed and then it rallied huge because they were making a boatload of cash because everybody was home and working on their house. People are going to Home Depot. They're not working. They have extra cash the government's giving them. So let's fix up the house. I can do it myself. It's cheaper. I have the time, whatever the case is. So boom, they came out. This double top was nice. That was a fun ride to the downside. But yeah, we've definitely got some significant resistance there about 330. I like this actually. But we've got to wait for earnings to come out because who knows what that's going to do. NVIDIA, that, yeah, this is no surprise. Um, oh, it's popped up a bunch today. Woo! Big bullish and golfing pattern. Are they really? I thought they came out with earnings already on well, the 23rd aftermarket. Uh, yeah, I would expect them to rally up here again before the earnings. But this is the last earnings. And that right there is just kind of insanity to me. This is what I would call irrational exuberance. <laughs> but this is another one that makes me cranky too. Okay. Thanks for bringing them up. All of you that brought up those trades. Oh, Karen, you brought them both up. This is all on you. Now I'm going to be depressed the rest of the day. 
Because you see this inverted head and shoulders, it's absolutely beautiful, right? <laughs> Except this neckline is very steep, which I'm not a big fan of when they're steep like that. But then it broke out and I was waiting for it to pull back a little bit to see if it did. And I just, I was like, I don't know if it's going to keep going. And I should have, uh, I should have picked up at least one or two contracts, but I didn't. And now, you know, we run from what's that 175 to 450. I mean, it, it's easy to look back now and say, well, if I would have known that I would have bought, you know, two year leaps, you know, I could have bought the two fifties and I would have banked out for, you know, they probably were 10 or 20 bucks. They would have been worth 200 up here, but would have, should have, could have, right. It's easy to look back and say, well, but um, realistically, I most likely would have gotten out. You know, I would have pulled profit right here at 227. But uh, it was a nice looking pattern, except for that steep neckline. I just don't, those are, those are ones that make me a little skittish. But uh, so yeah, I get, I get a little cranky when I look at this one sometimes because it was a huge profit potential, but there's always those in there. The question is, when the perfect pitch comes, are you going to swing at it? And you don't really know it was the perfect pitch until after it goes by. So uh, you just have to swing and eventually the perfect pitch comes and you swing just right and you connect and boom, you get a home run. And home runs like this don't happen very often. When I say not very often, I'm talking once a year, once every two, maybe three years. A home run like this would be every probably five, 10 years. If you got in, you know, if you played this pattern or if you picked it up down here about a hundred bucks and you rode all the way to 450, that's like a once a decade type of trade. Okay? They just don't happen very often. Okay. Um, that's just the reality of it. But uh, it's still aggravating to miss them. To look back and say, ah, I would have, should have, could have. But we all have those in life, right? How many times have you heard people say, if I'd have bought that, that piece of real estate, it was only $40,000. Now it's worth a half a million dollars 30 years later. I would have, should have, could have, right? But you make decisions and you live your life the way you do and you do the things you do. And then, you know, you look back and go, I should have done this, should have done that. But uh, anyway, so yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, puts exactly. That's what I'm waiting for too. In fact, do we see anything? Uh, oh, we got the beginnings, left shoulder head, not a beautiful head. It's kind of a wonky head, but who cares if it's the head anyway, if it rallies up here into earnings and then tanks from earnings, then we have a actual head and shoulder. So we have the beginnings and this is where if you haven't had patterns to flash, this is why you should get it because then you'll start to see things like this as they're forming. That was the whole purpose of that tool is to be able to recognize and see patterns forming before they go so that you don't miss the trade. If NVIDIA pops back up here, we've got just a little bit of... If it gets up, up anywhere here, if it can't break the new high, if it can't get above this 475 level and it rolls over, especially if it takes a week or two, which earnings are on the 23rd, which is what, next week? So if it comes up and kind of rolls over like this and then it breaks down, then we have a nice look at head and shoulders. I think I, I, I think it's overblown. I think I said that earlier, but... Um, what percentage of money do you put in such a long-term strategy? Not much. Most of my trading is very short-term. If I do, and I, I don't do long-term ones very often, uh, I've got some uh, bearish long-term trades right now, but uh, just because I think the market's headed lower. But uh, yeah, exactly. It's a long time to wait for a return on investment. And you've got to keep in mind that there's the, the risk of, uh, um, what's that? I can't remember the technical term, but it, it's the risk of you know getting hammered on the downside. Um, Black Swan, that's not the one I was trying to think of, but a Black Swan event happens. You know, that's the thing. I, I'm not bullish on the overall market, even though it's been bullish for six or seven or eight months. I still think overall, I think the macro picture is still bearish. I think this is a relief rally. We sold off pretty heavy in 22. I think there's a lot of people that are still piling money into the market. Um, there's another reason to be bearish too. I mean, if you think about it, and I'm sorry, <laughs> I know some five minutes over. Um, as unemployment ticks up, and I know people that have lost their jobs. And when they lose their jobs, guess what happened to their 401k contributions? They're gone, right? If you get laid off and, you know, if you're making $10,000 a month and you're putting 5% into your 401k, that's 500 bucks a month. That was going into the market. It was getting invested. But money market managers, or, or not money market, but mar uh, money managers that manage the 401ks were putting that money to work in the market. 
But now that 500 bucks from you and 10,000 or 15 or 20 other thousand people is now getting not getting invested in the market. What happens then? Right? And then you got the boomers. And there's where I think a lot of the boomers are going to, at some point, especially if the market starts to sell off, if there's some kind of black swan event, if there's some kind of panic event, the boomers that are sitting there going, I'm going to retire in a year or two. I got all my money exposed in the market. I can't afford to lose half of it. And they start to sell, it creates this cascade effect, right? So you've got all these, again, you take, you take these little pieces of the puzzle and you start to look at them and you go, one little thing, one minor thing or even one major thing that happens could start this domino effect. And it could get really ugly. So I'm of the opinion, I'm leaning to the bear side. If I'm going to put trades on, if they're bear, bullish, I'm going to be in very short term with tight stops. And I've been had that for the last six or seven months since we did turn up a little bit. That's the attitude I've had. Is that if I'm getting in a bullish position, which I've taken some, I'm in short term, tight stops, because if things turn, they're probably going to turn quickly. But when that comes, again, it remains to be seen. So you think it's going higher before lower? I wouldn't be surprised. I would not be surprised to see the market go up and ring the bell. If it goes up and hits the all-time high, I, yeah, I mean, I understand the argument. I don't think it's as big a deal as you do. I just don't. I, I think, well, I think if things, if you don't have a major black swan event, if you don't have another bank fail, if you don't have something big happen, then I think the, the elections could have a bullish effect if something like that happens. So in other words, if there's no event that causes a downward move, then I think you'll be right. But if something big happens, like a failed bank, another failed bank, a medium or big size, I think that will completely negate the election part. So I'm with you. I'm halfway there, not, uh, maybe a quarter of the way there. That elections will have a bullish impact on the market unless. Makes sense? Clear as mud, right? My coffee's gone. That means I have to shut up. <laughs> I need a new cup. Actually, I've only, I already had three, so. Any other real quick questions? Because I, I, I know I'm way over, so. Because, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't, I think the analysis is good, Karen, and, and the elections do have an effect, but the question becomes which one becomes bigger. And if there's nothing that shocks the market, then I think, uh, I think you're probably right. But if there's that shock, that's when all bets are off. There's not much that was, just like COVID, look back to COVID. I mean, there's nothing that was stopping that thing. Right? There was there was no good news that could come out that stopped that thing from just bleeding, falling off a cliff, because everybody was in a panic. And when that happens, nothing matters until people <laughs> get their senses right again. So, all right. Well, hopefully we'll all see you tonight at uh, eight o'clock Eastern time, five o'clock my time, and uh, if not, we'll see you in the morning, hopefully, or next week, or in patterns of flash or weekly whispers. Um. I'm drawing a blank on the name. What was it again? <laughs> Where'd it go? Oh, becoming a pattern whisperer. So talking about patterns, they're going to get a little bit deeper. So, all right. Y'all have a great day. Have a great week. And uh, yes, it is, Will. So you already have it. So, but you can come and have some fun if you want, if you're bored. All right, you're welcome. Thank you all for the comments and the questions and keeping it interactive. It's always more fun to have a two-way conversation than just talking to myself. So, all right. All right, y'all take care. God bless. Bye-bye.